I think we all know what we mean when we use the word fatigue uh, in everyday conversation. Well, we mean that we're tired. But fatigue has got a lot of shades of meaning. For example, it can refer to a lack of energy. Some people mean it's a sense of physical weakness or a feeling that tasks require more effort than they should. It can refer to a feeling of sleepiness uh, or a desire to rest. Or some people use it to mean a lack of motivation. Even boredom in your work or home life is an important cause of feeling fatigued. To experience fatigue in these situations is a normal aspect of everyday life. It's not an illness, uh, especially when we've not slept well, when we're under stress or when we're hungry. There are many symptoms people describe as fatigue. Some people who consult me tell me that carrying out normal activities like climbing the stairs or hanging up the washing requires an undue sense of, of effort. Um, and that's what they mean by fatigue. Other people complain of feeling sleepy, irritable, or low in mood. But apart from th this kind of nuisance level fatigue that's normal and we all experience in our daily life from time to time, there are lots of medical conditions that commonly present with fatigue as an important symptom. For example, heart failure in which the heart muscle does not pump efficiently or lung disease caused by smoking, hormonal problems like thyroid disease or adrenal gland problems like Addison's disease. These are all important causes of fatigue. We also see fatigue in chronic liver or con chronic kidney disease or in celiac disease. That's a gut problem where the uh, small bowel lining becomes uh, damaged by gluten intolerance. And of course, we often see fatigue with uh, common problems like anemia, we see it with medications like antidepressants and painkillers, and we see it in people who drink alcohol to excess or, or in other forms of substance abuse. I think what we've been discussing until now is normal everyday fatigue or tiredness and fatigue due to common um, health disorders. It's important to distinguish this kind of everyday tiredness or fatigue from the much rarer condition of ME-CFS or myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome. This is potentially a much more serious condition in which physical and mental fatigue develop, usually quite abruptly, often, although not always, after an infection. Now, this type of fatigue is intrusive and it stops people carrying out normal activities like exercise, socializing, or sometimes even going to school, to university, or to work. In the worst cases, people can be housebound or even bedbound. And it's this severity of fatigue that helps to make ME-CFS clearly different from normal fatigue. The other hallmark of ME-CFS, without which the diagnosis cannot be made, is known as post-exertional malaise. And this refers to a marked increase in fatigue occurring usually 24 hours or more after increased physical or intellectual effort. So there are numerous medical conditions that cause fatigue, some of which we've already covered. I'm a consultant rheumatologist and the majority of my professional work is spent caring for people with inflammatory arthritis, conditions like rheumatoid, psoriatic arthritis, inflammatory spinal disease, lupus, and other forms of autoimmune disease. For these patients, alongside their joint pain and swelling, fatigue is for many of them the most intrusive aspect of living with their condition. And the symptom that is unfortunately the most difficult for doctors to get to grips with or to put right. Fatigue is also seen in common conditions like obstructive sleep apnea. That's when people snore loudly and stop breathing many times during the night while they're asleep. Fatigue is really common after COVID. Since May 2020, I've been seeing large numbers of people who caught COVID who have persistent fatigue for months afterwards. This is popularly known as long COVID, but in the UK, physicians usually refer to it as post-COVID-19 syndrome. Some of these patients I've seen were hospitalized or ventilated on intensive care units, and there are complex reasons behind their persistent fatigue. Many have organ damage caused by the virus directly or indirectly through provoking clotting problems. Others have had to deal with the psychological impact of having a serious, potentially fatal infection. Many uh, experience symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, particularly those who are on intensive care units. And PTSD is an important cause of fatigue. 
preliminary data from the UK's FOSP COVID study, which followed patients discharged from hospital with COVID, show that only 25% of patients felt fully recovered 12 months after discharge from hospital. And this, I think, is a worryingly low figure. The other big group I'm seeing with long COVID is younger, reasonably fit people under the age of 50 who caught COVID that seemed fairly mild at the time and did not require hospitalization, but has been complicated by a persistent fatigue problem. We're still learning a lot about this and it's too soon to draw firm conclusions about the mechanisms. But from my perspective, long COVID in this group seems similar to the kind of post-viral fatigue syndrome I've been seeing for decades in a subset of people who catch glandular fever, and a number of other viral or bacterial infections. We still don't know what causes this, but we can usually give helpful advice and guidance that allows people to cope with their symptoms until we hope a natural recovery occurs in its own time. I've seen many people who've made a steady recovery over a 12 month period, lots who've completely recovered. And unfortunately, some people who seem to have got stuck. Well, if we're talking about normal everyday fatigue, then I think healthy routines of exercise, sleep hygiene, and a balance of work, rest, and relaxation can make a huge difference. Finding healthy ways like this of dealing with life's unavoidable stressors is important. But I think just as important is avoiding unhealthy ways of trying, trying to relieve stress. For example, smoking, drinking to excess, or using other addictive substances or even gambling or other risk-taking activities. These often feel relaxing or distracting from stress at the time, but they bring new problems and stresses of their own, and ultimately, I feel, are counterproductive. 